looking at stuff here, and it says that Satan is reporting snowfall <laughs> in his home. There's multiple sightings of flying pigs, and my commie overlords have permitted me to go to church. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. To open this morning, I'm going to read you um, <clears throat> our call to worship, hope, and comfort. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Stop being anxious and watchful, for I am your God. I give you strength. I bring you help. I uphold you with my victorious right hand. The eye of Yahweh is on those who fear him on those who rely on his love to rescue their souls from death and keep them alive in famine. It is by faith and through Jesus that we have entered this state of grace in which we can boast without looking forward, that we can boast about looking forward to God's glory. But that is not all we can boast about. We can boast about our sufferings. These sufferings bring patience, as we know. And patience brings perseverance. And perseverance brings hope. And this hope is not deceptive, because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit which has been given us. May the God of hope bring you such joy and peace in your faith that the power of the Holy Spirit will remove all bounds to hope. At this time, we'll have the congregational prayer for those of you that can kneel. Uh, please join us. Holy Father in heaven, what a beautiful day to be able to open our doors and gather here as a family. We invite you to be in our hearts and our minds and be with Tim as he brings your word. We thank you for the words of Eric and the time of creation that has been so special and Sabbath is a part of that creation. We are delighted to join together to worship you. We thank you for bringing us through to this point. We know there's still a lot of things that need to be done, but this is a step and we're grateful. We pray for every single one that is here today and for those that couldn't be here. We pray for Verdi as she is recovering, dear Lord. Continue to be with her and give her strength with her voice. And we thank you for Renee that she is helping her so much. We pray for Ken and Sylvia, dear Lord. Yes, Ken is not doing well. He's only slightly improved, but at least they are in an area now where they have caregivers for help. And we thank you for that. They are missing us today and we are missing them. We pray, dear Lord, for all of the requests that we have missed the last few weeks. You know what they are. And we thank you that you have the answers and that we trust you in giving us the right answers. Again, we ask that you be with Tim as he brings your word we thank you for being here with us today and be with each family. We ask these things in your loving name. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. It's a little different, but we're here. Our doors are opened, and we are very, very appreciative that we can all be together and have our doors open. Um, I know this has been a difficult time, and uh, we've all had a lot of complaints about it. We don't like restrictions. We uh, have had so much freedoms that we just don't like restrictions. And I agree. I agree. But I choose to look at it positive. That right now, things are looking better. And uh, we're here today as a family. Amen. So I'm going to dwell on the positive. Thank you. And uh, with each step, it's going to get better. Um, and really, ultimately, God is in charge. For which I am so grateful. His perfect plan is in place. And that's what I have had tried to remember all of these weeks that we've been isolated. God's perfect plan is in place. I don't have to worry about it because his plan is there. So, but you know, I, I am not ever going to take it for granted every Sabbath morning that I get to walk through those doors. You know, sometimes we take things for granted. Sometimes it takes something like this to kind of wake us up. We don't take it for granted ever again. It's a privilege to be able to open those doors and walk through those doors and come together and worship with God. So like I said, God's plan is in place and I'm taking it in a positive way. Well, <clears throat> I I uh, don't have any really announcements. Uh, you heard me mention that um, Verdi is still recovering at home and Renee's been helping her as much as she can and uh, uh, we want to keep Verdi in our prayers and she's still got a ways to go with uh, her recovery and it's not easy. And uh, we want to keep her in our prayers. Um, Ken has been suffering still from uh, urinary tract infections, and um, he has gotten a slight little bit better, and he's still not communicating or talking very much at all, but he is acknowledging he knows where he is now. So Sylvia's got a lot ahead of her too, so we want to keep them in our prayers. Are there any other, um, yeah, Sess? Okay, we missed a lot of birthdays the last few weeks. <laughs> we have missed a lot of birthdays. I think we missed what? We missed Jesse's? No, we missed Sessie's. Yeah, we missed Frank's. Uh, we missed Michael's. He had one. Oh, Sophia had one, that's right. I saw that. She turned two. So we missed a lot of birthdays. Ralphie, too. Yeah, that's right. Ralphie had one, too. Next Thursday is also Eva's birthday. Okay, see, we like I said, we missed a lot of birthdays. Sorry, Sophia's teenager. She's going to be 13. Oh, my. We'll catch up. We'll catch up. We'll catch up. Anyway, we're glad everybody is here today, and um, we're glad you're uh, doing what you're supposed to do, keeping your little distance, and we'll follow this. I'm sure these rules are going to be wiped out in the next few weeks, so be patient. Everything yes, Jesse. Daily. Oh, yeah. so, so those who may have known uh, Bill Hurst, uh, senior, he passed away, um, well, his son uh, just he just had a stroke a couple of days ago. Oh my goodness. And we're not sure if it's a major or a minor. I heard he was going through chemo for cancer. Mm. So I work with his grandson and I told him I would you know, keep him in prayer. I asked the church to keep him in prayer. Uh, I've known the family for a long time. Blight has known the family for a long time. They're very well known here. So yeah, just if you can do that, keep them in prayer, please. Okay, we'll, we'll definitely put him on our prayer list. Um, 
definitely. Anything else? Yeah, I'd also like to ask for a prayer request for a friend of mine as well. Sandy's name is David. Uh, he's also with him of chemo, and he had, a, I believe, stage four cancer. Mm -hmm. And um, he's just been going through a lot of therapy, and things are really, really looking up for him. He looks like he's getting better. looks like he's getting his muscle back. He's in a wheelchair at the moment, but, you know, he's getting his strength back. I just like to ask the Lord that he's going to handle it. Yes, yes. I'd like to turn for prayer for my son, Joey. He's not feeling good, so he, that's why he's not here today. Uh, and also for uh, Ralphie's Marina's aunt passed away last week. Yeah. And uh, Letty's aunt Ooh. is fighting the virus right now. So um, it would be Joey, Rafi, and Letty. Okay, that to him too. Yes, Frank. So I have one more, surely. She called and talked to Sandy and I. Yesterday or the day before, she really before. having a hard time. Yeah. She's just, she cried and sobbed the whole time. Yeah. This uh, isolation has not been good for her loneliness. She's already suffering a lot from the loneliness, and this isolation has not improved it. But one positive thing, she had her um, new mammogram done two days ago, and it was clear. So, we were okay. praised for that okay. and very happy for that. But she had some other tests to go. There's a spot on her liver, but they knew that was there. It's something they're watching, but she's going through that test. And um, so there's just some things that we have to keep praying for sure. She, like I said, it's very hard for her. So, okay. At this time, I'm going to take just a couple of minutes, and I don't want any of the kids to come forward. You stay where you are. But I want to share a little children's story with you that I found that is kind of goes along with our uh, faith and hope um, that we kind of are hanging on to right now. And it, so I kind of wanted to share it with you. Okay, raise your hands, kids. Where are you? Let me see. Oh, good. The big one's clear in the back. Very good. All right. <laughs> well, this is just a short little story. But it's really kind of fun the way it ends, so pay attention. This was a, a mother and her daughter. Now, they weren't young. The mother was probably my age, which means she was old. And the daughter was probably in her 50s or 60s. And uh, they were both uh, without a spouse at this point in their lives. And so they decided they were going to uh, move in together. Now, that meant they had two households full of furniture, dishes, everything that they were going to have to pare down into a smaller house. So they decided they were going to have a yard sale. How many of you have been to a yard sale before? Ah, yes. It's always fun. You might find a treasure. You never know. Well, they had furniture. They had clothes, they had kitchen stuff, and oh, they had some old jewelry that they hadn't used, and uh, I mean, they just had lots of books. They had a whole yard full of stuff. Well, the <laughs> uh, neighbor of one of them said, well, I've got some stuff I want to bring over too. So they said, okay. So she brought some furniture, and she brought Oh, some other little odds and ends, and, and it was five pairs of kids' shoes that the kids had outgrown, but they were in good shape. So she put those out, and people started coming, and before this all started, they kind of said, well, if we could make a little bit of money, it would be nice to go to the church and give the money to the church because it needed a new roof. Well, you know, churches always need something. Well, this little church needed a new roof. And so they decided that 
if they could make about $350 off of their yard sale, it would be really good to help towards getting the new roof done, or at least repair. And so they spent all day out in the sun. We know how that is. I've had yard sales and you get warm. And they sat out there and oh, things started selling a little bit, but none of the furniture really sold. And um, uh, the mother had called one of her friends and said they were having this sale and, uh, you know, kind of what they had. And she said, well, I'll come and look. But she didn't come. So finally, towards the end of the day, they still had some furniture left and these five pairs of shoes. And so they decided, well, we're just going to drag it all out to the curb and put a free sign on it and let anybody come and take it that wants what's left. So they started dragging things out to the curb and uh, the lady that was supposed, the friend that was supposed to come and see if there was anything she needed, she uh, called and she said, I'm on my way, I just was running late. And she pulled up in a pickup and oh, she was so excited. Well, come to find out, her family had had a fire and all of their stuff was gone. And so when she saw that furniture, she was thrilled. She took the furniture and she took the five pairs of shoes because she had five children and each pair fit each child. Five little pairs of shoes. And she was so thrilled. So they helped her load everything up that was left that she wanted, and off she went. And so they felt really encouraged and good because they had helped somebody that really needed something. And the mother finally said, you know, she said, I forgot that they had had that fire, and now they've got shoes and some furniture and things that they really needed. And she said, plus we made a little bit of money and her daughter was finishing counting the bills and her daughter said, yeah, how much do you think we made? How much do you think they made? $350. That's exactly They made the $350 to the penny. So they got the roof repair and they helped the family out with free stuff that was really needed. I thought that was a really neat little story about how God answers prayers sometimes when you don't even pray for it. And it's still there, and it still happens. Anyway, we wish you all a very happy Sabbath. Uh, no lunch yet, but that will come down the road here. But at this point, I'm gonna wipe the microphone because Tim, you don't have any germs. Uh, Tim, uh, I don't think I do, but Tim does it. Tim is in one of those uh, iffy uh, lifestyles. <laughs> and I don't want to give him anything. <laughs> so we're going to turn it over to him. Put my mask back on. Oh, by the way, there will be, again, I will announce, at the close, there will be baskets on the foyer table that are labeled for Sabbath School, Church, and Tithe, and for the children's offering. Just drop your money in the basket. We're not passing anything around. see everybody. Happy to be in church. I really am. Yeah. However, a couple of things I want to say before we start our Bible study this morning. And it's important that uh, I share them with you because you get a frame of mind where I'm coming from. And that is that uh, how many of you saw the sunrise this morning? A few of you did see the sunrise. It was church, wasn't it? It was amazing, wasn't it? It was church. I was in church this morning. I want to share with you, we're in church right now, but I was in church this morning. I, I'm connecting with God this morning in ways that I have, well, let's just say they're new, but 
historically, for most of you that know me, I love sunrises anyway. And uh, that's not something that just started in the last few months for, for me. But I find God with a sunrise, finding a way also to hear the word of God and to disciple with him. And that's what I was doing this morning. Maybe Letner and Lupe, you were doing the same thing. It's important that I share with you the fact that church is where you are. And I want to be here. I want you here. But uh, I have noticed over the last few months, this is a strong church. Amen. As I'm wiping tears away this morning from my eyes, I don't quite know why, except I'm thinking about our church this morning and the fact that we were going to be able to be open. Partly because of today's reality of this scamtemic is unbelievably sad. No doubt about it to me. It's also partially because despite of it all nature of church, it's unbelievably beautiful. It really makes a difference for me for us to be here together. And behind the malaise around us of social distancing and the disconnect that comes with it, for those who follow Jesus, us, the worst of this time, or at least for me, has been the loss of the ability to gather together for worship. Now, many of us are asking, how long will this go on? How long will this before we get back to normal? One of the things that I realized over the last couple of months, I went to church at Letner and Lupe's and family, and Tammy was there. I went to church. I went to church at Kathy's house. I went to church when I saw Jesse, because I'm always breaking down, I need new parts. I went to church and saw him. What did we end up talking about? Church. I went to church to see other people. For many of you, you got church. Eric, who came to your house Friday night and brought this? I forget. <laughs> who came to Eric's apartment and brought this? Raise your hands and, and tell the church your name. Destiny. Eric doesn't remember. Destiny. Destiny, that's right. Who else was there? Grandma was there? Yeah, Grandma was there. And Ceci was there. Little Ceci and Big Ceci and Destiny. How many of you got one of these? Not everybody in the church. Don't be mad, please, if you didn't get one. But this was church, wasn't it? It was. It was amazing for me, and I want to share that with you all. I'd like to know if maybe it's possible the church board will let us put them up on the walls here. If not, in the church. If not, maybe we can put them up in the fellowship hall, if you still have them. This was really special for, for Eric and I to get this as an example. Church, also, I've noticed... has been through a family having Bible studies through Zoom. Amen. That was church, or that is church. We've had to be creative. I want to thank Eric because he's been taping uh, the Bible studies. We don't have the capability of live streaming. I'm not going to get into that. The point is, is that we've been able to find ways to church, haven't we? Amen. And we've stayed strong. I've also realized that there has been a prayer chain through telephone, through texting, I don't do that, social media. The church has stayed strong in many, many ways. I know that many are praying for me. We're praying for Verdi. We've been praying for Ken and Shirley, Shirley and Ken and, and um, Sylvia. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that we've stayed strong throughout all of this, even though we what is that term that they say? Stay strong even though you're living apart or something? Whatever it is. The point is, we've stayed, and the church has recorded um, a way to be at its best under the circumstances. We can't touch each other. We can't touch the doors as we enter and exit. We can't sing hymns. We can't call to worship. I can't imagine soon that the practice of turn around and greet your neighbor that Letner likes to do, 
is going to resume, if it ever does. But we're here this morning, and I say praise the Lord. Amen. There was an inspired writer that has written, If we give in to frustration, we will surrender to despair and be unfaithful. If we had foolish, unchristian hopes about human culture, they're now shattered. If we thought we were building up a heaven on earth, if we looked for something that would turn the present from the place of a pilgrimage into a permanent city, satisfying the soul of man, we are all disillusioned. We are, and not a moment too soon. So as we gather here this morning, I say praise God, and we are changed, there's no doubt about it. We are changed, we will be changed. We will know what it is to be kept apart from now on and then being brought back together. Here's the thing. We need to hear the word of God in church, in person, with our own ears, with a special realization that we need the bread of life. And apart from that, what happens to us? We perish, don't we? We perish. Now, having said that, the world is not moved by love or actions that are of human creation, and the church is not empowered to live differently from any other gathering of people without the Holy Spirit. When believers live in the power of the Spirit, the evidence in their lives is supernatural. I'm convinced of that. The church, it cannot help but be different, and the world cannot help but notice. I pray the Holy Spirit on us and in this sanctuary this morning. I pray that we can have the blessings that the Holy Spirit gives us. Having said that, do you know that this is a birthday weekend? Are you all aware of that? It's Pentecost weekend. Is there something significant for us to be able to be open on Pentecost weekend? We celebrate the birth of Christ. All the world pauses to celebrate Christmas with us, right? There's nobody in this room that doesn't know about Christmas or the birth of Christ, right? Even our little children, toddlers know that, right? You're going to tell me, Diego, your little one doesn't know about, of course, she knows about the birth of Jesus. She's crying for a Porsche, isn't she? That's right. Okay. We also celebrate his resurrection. We just had that a few weeks ago. Isn't that correct? Most of the world recognizes Easter as a very special day on the calendar, but today is Pentecost weekend. Pentecost. Hardly anybody re realizes that. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? What is the significance of that? I want to touch on that this morning because this day is important because why? In a sense, it's the birth of the church. It's the birthday of the church. Now, without being able to tell you where I found it in scripture or in literature, I should say, I believe the church was initiated with the plan of salvation at the beginning. That's what I believe. But Pentecost is when the church actually ended up beginning because that's when it spread not only through Jerusalem, but then it began to spread throughout all four corn, the four winds. Why? We'll talk about that. We'll touch on that. We're going to take some passages from Acts of the Apostles in a few moments. But if you have your Bibles, open them up to the second chapter of the book of Acts. And we're going to read about the beginning of the church. The first chapter, the first chapter tells us of Jesus meeting with the apostles on the Mount of Olives. And he tells them that they're to be his witnesses to all the world. He also tells them that they're to wait in Jerusalem until they receive the power on high. And then he ascends out of their sight. So what do the apostles do? They do as they're told. They go to Jerusalem to wait and pray. They do more than that, though. We're going to touch on that from the book Acts of the Apostles. I want to read the first 12 verses. And then I want to go down to verses 14 and 16. And listen, listen, as I read these verses. 
Now, you're supposed to have your own Bibles. You've got to start remembering to bring your own Bibles, apparently. We can't touch our Bibles in the pews. We can't touch the hymnals in our pews. Okay, fair enough. So if you don't have your Bibles, I'll read. I'll read. Second chapter of the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tons of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthenians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, well, they've had too much wine. In the midst of all this excitement, the Apostle Peter spoke up and got the crowd's attention. Then he said to them, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And the beginning, and beginning with those words, Peter, he preached to them about Jesus. He tells them, he tells them, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. Listen to verses 36 to 41. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Well, brothers, what do we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them. This is Peter. And he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So what was that day all about? What was significant about that day? Well, I did a lot of study, and I read from the book Acts of the Apostles, and chapter 4 talks about Pentecost. And let me take some paragraphs, sections of this chapter and share with you what was significant about the day and why it really makes a difference in the history of a church. Reading from the inspired writer. As the disciples returned from Olivet to Jerusalem, the people looked on them, expecting to see on their faces expressions of sorrow, confusion, and defeat, but they saw their gladness and triumph. The disciples did not now mourn over disappointed hopes. They had seen the risen Savior, and the words of his parting promise echoed constantly in their ears. In obedience to Christ's command, they waited in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, the outpouring of the Spirit. And guess what? They didn't wait in idleness. They weren't just sitting around, standing around, moping around. The record says that they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Taken from Luke chapter 24, verse 53. 
And they also met together to present their requests to the Father in the name of Jesus. And as the disciples waited for the fulfillment of the promise, they humbled their hearts in true repentance and confessed their unbelief. And as they called to remembrance the words that Christ had spoken to them before his death, they understood more fully their meaning. How do you think that was so? They were living with him. They were listening to him on a daily basis. They were taking him for granted, weren't they? We do that ourselves, don't we? But then comes the, death, the passion and death of Jesus and then the resurrection. All of a sudden, all those words have a different meaning, don't they? Isn't that like us as parents, or like us as kids of parents? We're told to do something, we don't listen, we learn the hard way. Or then we say, we have an aha moment, don't we? <laughs> now, how many of us can relate to that? JJ's not here. I was going to ask JJ, okay, JJ, how many times has Dad said to you, you didn't listen. Okay, Diego, pay attention, because that's what's going to happen to you very soon. Has, has mom said anything about that yet? Guess who's going to say, no, dad, if she already isn't? Yeah, yeah. It's amazing to watch her growing up, isn't it? It really is. And guess what? She's a spitting image of you. What you were doing to your mother is going to come back. It's going to come back, isn't it? Now, the disciples, they prayed with intense earnestness for a fitness to meet men in their daily intercourse to speak words that would lead sinners to Christ. And putting away all differences. Remember, they had differences. Remember, they argued. Remember, they fought. Typical, right? But putting away all differences, all desire for the supremacy, they came close together in Christian fellowship. The days of preparation were days of deep heart searching. That's what they were doing. That's, what, that's what's been good for me to be able to do the last few months. We've had to improvise, haven't we? We've had to make church a little different, haven't we? I appreciate what Sandy did for Mother's Day. I got to see almost all of you. And that was amazing. We probably would have done something for Mother's Day anyway, right? But we had to improvise. And the church came together. I got to see Mrs. Morgan. I got to hear I got to see her car again. I got to hear her complain about the fact that she doesn't like to be isolated. It was a real transaction, real opportunity to, to visit at the same time. It was church, and it was on Sabbath. Kathy didn't come, so I went over to her house, at church at her house, because I brought her the goods that, Kathy, or, that Sandy had made. And it made a difference. We've had to adapt. We've had to change. We've had to be able to accommodate. We've had to do a lot of soul searching in our church, and we've responded. And I'm grateful, that, and I'm happy to be a member of this church as a result. This is what the apostles were doing. They were looking back over what had been going on for the past three years, three and a half years, or whatever it was. The point is, is that they were looking at their relationship with Jesus, and it was in a new light. And it was in a new light. And on top of that, they were asking for forgiveness of the way they treated each other, and the way that they worked with each other, and realizing that there was a mission. That's what was, that's what was going on. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for the holy unction that was to fit them for the work of soul saving. They did not ask for a blessing for themselves merely. They were weighted with the burden of the salvation of souls. And they realized that the gospel was to be carried to the world and they claimed the power that Christ had promised. During the patriarchal age, the influence of the Holy Spirit had often been revealed in a marked manner but never in its fullness. And now in obedience to the word of the Savior, the disciples offered their supplications for this gift, and in heaven Christ added his intercession. He claimed the gift of the Spirit, that he might pour it upon his people. 
So the text says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as if a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now I learned something in, in uh, working on this for this morning. Go back to um, uh, chapter 2 in your, uh, in your Bible. And in, your, in many of your Bibles, there's a section uh, at the bottom that breaks down the verses. You can call it a concordance, you can call it strongs, whatever you want to do. But did you know, did you know that it was all believers, not just the apostles that were baptized with the Holy Spirit and spoke with other tongues? Did you realize that? Yes. Kathy says yes. Did everybody else realize that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I forgot. I have an excuse, but I, for, I still forgot. It, was, it wasn't just the apostles. See, I was raised to believe that it was only the apostles at first. That's significant because everybody that saw, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That becomes important for the spreading of the gospel. Do you understand the significance of that? And how important the Holy Spirit ends up being? Okay. That's just a point I wanted to, uh, to bring out that came out in my Bible. Now, Christ's ascension to heaven was the signal that his followers were to receive the promised blessing. For this they were to wait before they entered upon their work. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, he was enthroned amidst the adoration of the angels, and as soon as the ceremony was completed, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in rich currents, and Christ was indeed glorified, even with the glory which he had with the Father from all eternity. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. And according to his promise, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had as priest and king received all authority in heaven and on earth and was the anointed one over his people. The text continues. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit, assuming the form of tongues of fire, rested upon those assembled. And it was an emblem of the gift then bestowed on the disciples, which enabled them to speak with fluency languages with which they had heretofore been unacquainted. And the appearance of fire signified the fervent zeal with which the apostles would labor and the power that would attend their work. You have to understand, in history, the Galileans, which is where what most of the disciples were, they weren't very good talkers. They weren't known to be fluent in languages. Have you ever talked to a fisherman that that's all they do? You ever been around a fisherman, a full-time professional fisherman? Every other word is a word you don't want to repeat in church, usually. It's called salty language. That's what it's called. That's what many of them speak. My brother was a professional fisherman. He worked out of the, the Bay of Eureka for, for many years. He was a crabber, and uh, he also uh, uh, did salmon for many years. He picked up the language. Couldn't talk to him. Couldn't understand him. That's the kind of the way the Galileans were until they were touched by the Holy Spirit. Now, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And during the dispersion, the Jews had been scattered. That's what the dispersion word means, scattered, all right? They had been scattered to almost every part of the inhabited world, and in their exile, they had learned to speak various languages. And many of these Jews were on this occasion in Jerusalem attending religious festivals then in progress. Every known tongue was represented by those assembled. And this diversity of languages would have been a great hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel. God, therefore, in a miraculous manner, supplied the deficiency of the, of the apostles. And the Holy Spirit did for them which they could not have accomplished for themselves in a lifetime because they weren't very good speakers. Not just because they were scared, but because they were Galileans. They could now proclaim the truths of the gospel abroad, speaking with accuracy the language of those for whom they were laboring. 
And this miraculous gift was a strong evidence to the world that their commission bore the signet of heaven. And from this time forth, the language of the disciples was pure, it was simple, it was accurate, whether they spoke in their native tongue or in a foreign language. And the text continues. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. Now, how many of you have been to Pentecostal church service? We would not consider this church Pentecostal, would we? Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? I've been to many Pentecostal services in my history. I've been to a service that even believed in snakes and picking up snakes and all that stuff, and I won't go into that right now. But I've been to churches where they believed in the speaking of tongues. Have you ever been to one of those kind of churches? Okay. What was your experience? I wanted to run out. You wanted to run out? Mm -hmm. Because why? I'm not criticizing the churches, but the text clearly shows the speaking of tongues was such that you could understand the gospel in your native language, even if the person speaking did not speak your language normally. Did I understand? Did I, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Did I say it right? That's what that's what Pentecost was about, in in it in its simple form and misunderstood by a lot of, it's not gibberish where you're speaking and nobody understands. See the difference? Mm -hmm. And it's not where somebody else has to interpret for you because you're speaking gibberish. Do you understand the difference? And I'm not criticizing other churches, I don't have a right to do that. But somebody in the back, and it sounds like Sessie, said she wanted to walk out of the church because she went to one of those churches. Run. It didn't make sense for me when I, would, when I would encounter that or when people were dropping themselves on the um, floor and crawling and writhing like they were having a seizure. Foaming at the mouth. And foaming at the mouth, speaking in gibberish. So, please understand, I'm reading from the text what's going on as to the miracle of speaking in tongues. That's what I'm talking about. Now, the priests and rulers were greatly enraged at this wonderful manifestation. You can imagine that. But they dared not give away to their malice for fear of exposing themselves to the violence of the people. They had put the Nazarene to death, but here were his servants, unlettered men of Galilee, telling all telling in all the languages then spoken the story of his life and ministry. And the priests, they determined to account for the miraculous power of the disciples in some natural way, declaring that they were drunken from partaking largely of the new wine prepared for the feast. In answer to the accusation of the priest, Peter showed that this demonstration was in direct fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, wherein he foretold that such power would come upon men to fit them for a special work. That's what speaking in tongues is. Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, he said, be this known unto you, for hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing that it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So what it was, was with clearness and power, Peter bore the witness of the death and resurrection of Christ. Remember, he had just days before, well, by then it was more than that. It was weeks before he had denied his Lord, hadn't he? See the difference? There's a big difference. Because he was now touched by the Holy Spirit. 
Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. That's significant. Peter couldn't have said that before. Couldn't have. Now, the people, they heard the disciples declaring that it was the Son of God who had been crucified. The priests and the rulers, they trembled. Conviction and anguish seized the people. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the disciples, or the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And among those who listened to the disciples were devout Jews who were sincere in their belief. The power that accompanied the words of the speaker convinced them that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. The power of the gospel is what changes men. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Under the influence of this heavenly illumination, the scriptures that Christ had explained to the disciples stood out before them with the luster of perfect truth. The veil that had prevented them from seeing to the end of that which had been abolished was now removed, and they comprehended with perfect clearness the object of Christ's mission and the nature of his kingdom. They could speak with power of the Savior as they unfolded to their hearers the plan of salvation. Many were convicted and convinced. Their traditions and superstitions inculcated by the priests were swept away from their minds and the teachings of the Savior were accepted. Then, again the text, then they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Under the training of Christ, the disciples had been led to feel their need of the Spirit. And under the Spirit's teaching, they received the final qualification and went forth to their life work. No longer were they ignorant and uncultured. No longer were they a collection of independent units or discordant, conflicting elements. No longer were their hopes on the worldly greatness. They were of one accord, of one heart, and of one soul. Pentecost brought them the heavenly illumination, the truths they could not understand while Christ was with them were now unfolded. And with a faith and assurance they had never known before, they accepted the teachings of the sacred word. No longer was it a matter of faith with them that Christ was the Son of God. They knew that. Although clothed with humanity, he was indeed the Messiah, and they told their experience to the world with a confidence which carried with it the conviction that God was with them. You might want to read chapter 4 and chapter 5 of the Acts of the Apostles if you get a chance later on today. So, I can't go to Lupe's house and have a birthday cake, can I? We can't have a birthday party and, and go over to people's houses right now in the state, right? Can't have more than nine people meeting together, is that the way it works? Social distancing and all that stuff in people's homes, is that the rule still? There's only five of us. I can have another five. Okay, Eric and I and Sandy and I know Frank has a sweet tooth, so we can come and that's still under ten. Okay, so Lupe, you're going to make a cake we're going to have a birthday. I put you on the spot, I'm sorry. But the point is, is it's happy birthday to the church today. So, the question I have for you is beyond that, is how do I, how do you know he lives? How do I know? Let me just personalize it and let you know. How do I know He, Christ, lives? How do I know that Christ has risen? What proof have I to give, not only to myself, but to others? My answer is real simple. 
He touched my life one blessed day, and I began to live. That's my answer to that. How do I know he left the tomb that morning long ago? I met him this morning when I had my devotions at sunrise. Maybe Letner, I'm not picking on you, Letner and Lupe did because they said that they saw the sunrise this morning as well. I met him this morning and I was really happy. I knew we were coming here this morning. I can't tell you how happy I was. You could say my heart was a glow, and yeah, there was a tear for, like I said, the sadness and also the beauty of the church of what's going on today. How do I know the endless life he gained for me that day? His life within me is proof enough of immortality. How do I know that Christ still lives and he gives rich blessings to impart because he walks with me? even though I'm a sinner and I make a lot of mistakes. And I have had bad days. I even had, I even had disagreements with Dr. Frank about all of this stuff that's going on. And, I, and I'm wrong. I, I admit that. Because as been pointed out during Sabbath school, I have a rebellious nature. And I admit that. God's got to continue to work in me. But he does live in me. The Spirit has been with the church since the first Pentecost so that it could enter our spirit, me, and enable us to be the kind of people or person, me, God intended for us to be. And each day we need to renew ourselves and allow God's Holy Spirit. Well, for me, it's got to it's got to replace my prideful nature. I got to say that with you. I got to admit it. But it has the spirit has to replace our prideful spirit so that we can bear His cross in this world. Can you agree with that? Do you understand a little better what Pentecost is all about? Ladies, enlist the guys cook in the house. I, I can't imagine Jesse cooking in the house. Bake a cake for the church. Have a happy birthday this, morning, uh, this afternoon for the church. Read chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Acts of the Apostles. If you don't have it, there may be copies in the front of the church. And get one. They're not germ. They're not full of germs, okay? You can take one if we have them, okay? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is so good to be here this morning, to be able to worship with fellow believers, with my friends, with my church family that I've known for so many years. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Lord, for opening our minds and hearts. We're celebrating, or at least talking about, Pentecost this morning. And I pray that we will realize that the Holy Spirit makes a difference in our lives. We ask that you touch us with the Holy Spirit. May it impart our life, may it be part of our life in a way that we can share it with others. May it change us, make a difference in our life. Help us to realize that when we make a mistake, we learn from the mistake, don't do it again because we repent of those sins or those mistakes. And realize that if we trust in you, our lives are completely different. I pray that you be with those that... Uh, can't be here because of illness. We talked about Verdi. Since this is uh, being taped, Verdi, we're thinking about you. We also ask that you be uh, with uh, your boys. Thank you for Renee for helping. And uh, we pray that you're going to recover soon. You're a sister in arms because I know what you've been through and what you're going through. I pray that we also uh, take care of Ken. I take care of a person that's got a similar diagnosis, and it's hard on Sylvia. Be with Sylvia as well. Be with Shirley. She's going through tough times. Even though she's had some good reports, she still has other issues to think about. She also has her son that she's uh, helping with. I pray that you also be with other members, uh, such as Carlene. She's not forgotten. And uh, Lisa, be with her who takes care of her. We have church members in Texas, be with them. We have church members in the Dakotas, be with them. We have a church member that's in Florida, be with Ralph as well. I ask that you touch each of us and those requests that are not mentioned, but you know our hearts and our minds and you know who they are. Uh, be with those that were mentioned this morning during our church service, such as David and uh, anyone else that may need special 
comfort this morning. Give them a Sabbath day's rest and let them know that they're not alone. I pray that we continue to grow strong and trust in you more than anything else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.